Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Litchfield, Autism, Disability, and Health Advocate of Ryan's Voice, and this is the second episode of Ryan's Voice with Friends. And tonight, I have an, uh, my second um, guest, who is um, another um, autism advocate, and his name is Marcus. Hi, Marcus. Could you tell us a little bit hey. about yourself? I am an autism. I'm I'm an autism activist. I am a music producer. I'm a professional DJ. I'm a clothing line owner. I'm a business. Um, I'm a CEO of uh, M Miss D Entertainment. I mean, uh, <laughs> I I do so much stuff. So yeah, definitely sounds like you you're really involved. Um, yeah, I, I at, before um, we started the show, um, I actually had an opportunity to look at your bio, and I saw that you're really into um, music, um, more specifically um, in the in the music industry. Um, Eighteen plus different um, genres of music. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, I make um, anywhere from gospel, jazz, R and B, funk, trap country rock edm house techno du uh, dubstep <laughs> heavy metal movie scores i mean <laughs> it doesn't really matter i play eight instruments i mean i've been doing this for almost 21 years so wow what kind of instruments do you play uh piano saxophone guitar trumpet drums organ flute clarinet Sounds like you definitely have a gift for music. <laughs> but it's been going on since, you know, I'm 37. So it's been going on since I was third, fourth grade. Wow. I've been doing music, concert band, marching band. <laughs> so I've been doing. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it, it, so, it definitely sounds, uh, sounds like you definitely, um, that's something that you're definitely passionate about. Yes, yes. And, you know, here recently, almost three years ago, I became an autism activist because, you know, I have autism myself, so I understand from a person that has autism and that um, grew up dealing with different situations, I understand wholeheartedly why, why there needs to be more of an, a voice and acceptance um, for autism and the individuals in the community worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you be comfortable telling us a little bit about your um, experiences with autism? Oh, yeah, sure. So I got diagnosed April 12, 1993. I was 10 years old. Um, so Dr. King gave me my, my diagnosis. So back then, 93, there was not like, <laughs> like pamphlets or books or anything to where your grandparents or your parents can be like, this is what you should do or might want to do with your child or your adult or your teenager. They just slapped me on a bunch of medication. I was on Ritalin, Depakote, Lithium, Seroquel, Zoloft, Paxil. I mean, I was on two or three pills a day, 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day. So when you on those different type of medications, they zombify you. You know, I was in extensive therapy. Um, I had a speech therapist, a behavior aid. I had a social worker because I was in foster care. Um, you know, I had emotional issues. Um, so the tender tangents was more advanced. The biting on people, jumping on them, scratching them, um, not me not being able to deal with certain colors, certain noises. I still can't deal with certain colors and certain noises at almost 40. <laughs> so um, certain foods, because of the color texture, I, I don't eat. I mean, you know, even as a music producer, it's still just certain noises I can't take even as a music producer. I know this sounds crazy, but it's just um, what it is. So I understood it from a perspective of, you know, I had IEPs all my life. I was in special education all my life. I went to schools um, strictly for that. Um, you're talking anywhere from mental institutions, uh, group homes, I mean, Special Olympics. I mean, my... my <laughs> It's a story. It's it's a story behind the smile. That's why I really became an activist because I wanted to help spread more awareness and acceptance and help be a voice for those who may not have one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it just from everything you've um, just told us so far, I mean, it sounds like you went through a lot of um, challenging and difficult experiences um, through your personal journey. But I think at the same time, you've also, over the course of time, like, have found a strength, you know, a gift, a strength, a talent in music. Um, I think it's kind of like, that's kind of like your go-to place, you know, like when you're experiencing, you know, some of these these challenges and stuff. Um, and another great point that I think you mentioned too is, um, you know, there are people with autism who do have challenges with sensory overload. And there are, you know, individuals with autism who can't tolerate certain noises. And even like, um, you know, certain foods, um, I think you meant, you know, like, you know, the just tasting different foods and stuff. Um, you know, it's all those different um, sensations that, that might just trigger that um, anxiety or, you know, just those feelings of distress. Um, so um, I can definitely see where, you know, where that can be um, a little bit challenging. And even for me, like when I was younger, um, noises would bother me too. Um, I remember even in elementary school, like when the kids were so loud and stuff, I was so overwhelmed. I felt distressed. Um, I just, it was definitely, um, very, very difficult to try to, you know, fit in with, with a lot of kids that were very active and, um, very socially involved with, uh, with, all, um, everybody. So, but, um, especially when I was younger, I definitely, especially with, um, like with structure, like I was somebody that really liked a lot of structure, but when there wasn't a lot of structure, um, and there was just a lot of noises, like during recess and stuff, I was like, I was not one of those kids that was all excited, like, you know, somebody else would be, you know, at recess time. Oh, I, oh, I get it. I, I get it. They used to let me be inside for recess. So coloring books, Legos, blocks, those things became <clears throat> um, more of a friend to me. And it was hard for me, too, to try to fit in because kids was loud in the lunchroom. So Ms. Johnson used to just let me eat my lunch in the classroom versus me eating my lunch at the ABC lunch or whatever with the other kids and stuff like that. So, you know, my I didn't do family events. I didn't really do those, go to the family events and stuff like that. So I had family members that was like my best friends. They still like my best friends. So I, I went with them instead of going with the with the um community yeah absolutely absolutely yeah um so and i've also noticed that um you were the winner of many special olympic trophies and certificates yes yes i still got them yes yeah, can tell yeah, see, we, see i didn't know it was special olympics they just said listen jump in this white van you know what I'm saying? We're going to go outside the classroom. So for me, anything outside the classroom was A+. plus. I didn't really, you know, we talk about 90, 1990, 1991, stuff like that. I didn't, I didn't know. I just knew that it was a chance to get out of the classroom. So, you know, I was dealing with a lot of nonverbal issues. Mm -hmm. So people had to point or I point or people had to walk me to it. So I, or I walk people to the activities I wanted to do or try. So track, um, it was never lifting weights, throwing the ball, running. Well, we, we walked, they let us walk. They didn't really let us run. They let us walk and we still got like red or, or blue ribbons, I guess for, for participating or we didn't really know who won if somebody but we all got certificates and ribbons. So we did this every year. Yeah. I mean, hey, you know, you're you're all working as a team, you know. It's like you're all, you know, you're all winners. You're all champions, you know. Um, yeah, and like when I was young too, I was involved in sports. Um, I did a little bit of – I played soccer when I was young. I played um, oh, okay. a little bit. Um I also played baseball for a little while. I think I played up to AAA. Uh, and I mean, it, it's kind of funny now, but it wasn't when I was younger. So um, one of the games, um, one of the pitchers um, threw a baseball right at my chest, which. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it hurt. It, I was definitely, it definitely hurt. Uh, but 
And I think I was like saying like, I'm not playing baseball anymore. <laughs> I'm like, I'm done. I'm done playing baseball. Uh, I mean, cause I mean, even like the next year, like think um, the coach that I had, he was like, you know, what? He's not playing baseball. He was one of the best players on the team. I'm like, yeah. So did you, also- did you quit? Did you quit and go back or you just quit altogether? I just, I just quit altogether because I was like, yeah, that was a, that was, I mean, when I was younger, that was a little bit traumatic, but that was like, um, yeah, I'm like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> See, that's, so, that, that, that happened to me in high school when I had to do concert band and we was doing the Thanksgiving parade at the Macy's parade in New York. And we had to wear the armor and I had to trumpet and you had to spin it and you had to do the choreographed, choreographed dances. At this time I was skinny. So, you know, we, we, we walk in 12, 13 blocks up the street and anybody know about New York, each block is like two blocks. Each one block is like two blocks. So we have to walk 12 to 13 blocks to do the concert. Listen, I told them I'm going to find the first buffet I can find. I think I got fat on purpose because like I was done. It was like, we, you can get a college scholarship. No, nope. really don't want it. No. Nope. No, 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 no. If I got to do this for four years in college, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's like, I'm done. <laughs> it's, it's, it's over. Yeah, it's done. I'm, 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 I'm moving on now. No, um, I actually, uh, speaking of bands and stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, I, um, I actually played the alto saxophone through middle school and high school. Um, oh, really? So I played the alto saxophone for a while. Um, and I played a little bit of piano too, a little bit of piano and keyboard. So I do have a little bit of a musical background per se. Um, well, we got to get together in the studio. We can make some magic. We got to get together. In the we got to make some magic. What, what kinds of, what kinds of songs are we going to play? Listen, whatever we can come up with, whatever we create, whatever we create. Whatever. All right. All right. I'll definitely take you up on that offer and definitely, uh, We'll have to get an album going at some point. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm down with it. I'm, I'm down. I'm down for it. I think that's why I got in music because music became my voice that I didn't have. Yeah, I have to warn you though. My singing voice is not what it used to be. When I was younger, I was able to sing. My dad was like, "Oh my God, you have the most amazing voice!" Because I could sing, you know, some of the songs, um, the some of the Disney songs, really well and stuff. And then it was like, as I got older, it was like. Uh, yeah, my singing voice is no longer there, and it just pretty much went out the window. <laughs> Don't feel bad. I can't sing neither. I can't even shower sing. So that's 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 bad when you can't shower sing. <laughs> it's like it's like oh yeah, even I mean yeah, I I don't even think I'd be able to sing in the in the shower either. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. Yeah. Um, but, um, and then also, um, I see that you like poetry as well. Um, I know you have other hobbies like poetry, um, art, video games. So can you um, elaborate? Yes, I love video games. I, I'm a Call of Duty fanatic. I will shoot you 150 feet away. Listen, okay? I'm a, I love Fortnite, um, <laughs> Assassin's Creed. I mean... You know, I'm a I'm a I'm a video game head. I'm an Xbox One head. I'm not a PlayStation Four head, so I'm more of an Xbox One type of person. But yeah, I love art galleries, museums, concerts, festivals, spoken word events, poetry readings, traveling, amusement parks. I'm scared of heights, so I won't get on the the actual ride, but I watch you ride it. I support. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. I probably would not want to be going up on a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, I can't do that. I, I, I can't. I, I can't do that. My life is already a roller coaster. I don't need to. <laughs> I know. I can't. Oh yeah. So, what type of stuff you like? Oh, let's see. What kind of stuff do I like? Um, I, I like video games too. Um, I play base, I'll play baseball video games. Um, I will, I like to go outside. Um, I do like to get exercise. Um, I like bikes. Um, I definitely, um, like doing, um, the, uh, 
web design I, as I, you know, with my own website and stuff. So I kind of like utilizing computer and technology and all that and learning different um, skills and, and concepts and stuff with okay. that. Um, I'm definitely like music. I, I mean, usually when, I, when I'm working, when I'm doing my job. So my job is an autism peer specialist. Okay. So um, as an autism peer specialist, what I generally do is I will, um, I'm like the extra layer of support for the case managers to support the individuals, you know, they might just need someone to talk to, you know, who can share um, lived experiences, just like I'm, you know, kind of doing right now um, here on the show. Um, but basically just, you know, because they too have, you know, personal community integration goals. Um, so they have goals that they want to achieve, you know, um, and one of the things, you know, I, I, I find very rewarding is just hearing all the different, you know, experiences and stories that um, adults, and so I mainly work with adults with autism. So um, it's okay. the, the experiences and stories that adults with autism um, bring. Um, and just, you know, not telling them what to do, because I'm not, you know, the goal with being a, a, like, a it's like I'm a mentor to them. I'm trying to you know, say, hey, you know, from my experiences, you know, I did, you know, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Um, but what I'm telling, you know, I'm showing them, you know, ha you know, have you thought about maybe, you know, looking into this, you know, maybe you should consider doing this. And, you know, doing, you know, trying to get them to be more independent in terms of doing, you know, the personal community goals. It mm -hmm. could be, so for example, I mean, I've worked with individuals that might need help with finding a job. So I'll say, you know, from my experience, I have found this resource to be helpful, this resource to be helpful. You know, I'm, it's like I'm tossing those ideas and suggestions to them, but at the end of the day, it's up to them as to, you know, how they want to tackle, you know, those kinds of situations. So right. it's like you're, you're providing them with the guidance and support, but you're not like telling them what to do. So, um, and I do find the work very rewarding. And then there's times where, you know, they have, you know, issues and concerns. And sometimes what's nice is, you know, coming from experience, you know, lived experience and, you know, having, you know, you know, the positive and the negative experiences, you know, I can tell, you know, my, the, the case manager that works with those individuals, you know, hey, this is what I'm noticing. These are my observations. You know, I talked with this individual. These are my, you know, these, we talked about these ideas, suggestions, you know, and, you know, this is what I think, you know, you as a case manager should do to follow up with this particular individual. So like with my organization, we're all working as a team and stuff um, to try to help, you know, try to, you know, change lives for the better. I think, you know, the work that we do as autism advocates and, you know, and even, you know, as an autism activist, as you stated, you know, we're trying to change lives for the better. Um, I think, you know, we're trying to promote hope to other individuals with autism to, you know, pursue their hopes and dreams. Wow. You, you know what, Ryan, you have now become my inspiration. Oh, thank you. Right. I, I pray that other individuals um, see your mission, see your um, your goals and your um, dedication into the autism communities and um, pattern all for the type of person and the attitude and the character that you have. So, you know, I take off my hat. If I had one, I take off my hat to you. Thank and you, you de definitely an inspiration because there's so many adults, teenagers, and children that's on the spectrum or that have autism or that has Asperger's and stuff of that nature and doesn't get recognized. Their stories don't, doesn't get told. Um, so that's, it's our job to be able to lift our voices so their stories can be told or their um, dreams can help be fulfilled through what we are doing in our own, in our own journey for autism equality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think um, another individual that I've met with earlier, um, we were talking about like autism and employment, for example. And um, 
what's really, really sad is, you know, 80 to 90% of adults with autism are either unemployed or underemployed. And I think, you know, part of the, re you know, there's several factors that go into that. And I think one of them is, you know, companies don't have the resources or the understanding of what autism exactly is. And I think the other piece is sometimes they just don't have the funding. So they may not be able to effectively accommodate um, somebody with autism. Um, but I think that's why, you know, you have all these different agencies and organizations, you know, that's why you have to reach out to those, you know, to try to get the funding and the grants and all that. So that way you can work with these individuals because, you know, whether if, you know, you're working, um, I mean, and so you're, you're going to, you have some individuals with autism who work um, a high, you know, they might get a higher salary position and then there's some that might have a lower salary position. Um, and to be honest, whether if they have a higher salary position or a lower salary position, you know, and I mean, I take that out of the equation, but I also take, um, uh, cause the other individual mentioned, you know, high IQ and low IQ, but I'm taking that out of the equation as well. And I think we have to look at, you know, people with autism as, you know, people like they're, they are people, they have names. Like my name is Ryan, you know, I'm not autism. I do have autism, but I'm, I'm, I always will have a name no matter what the diagnosis. Right. Is. Right. And I think um, what I tell is, you know, we have, you know, I tell individuals with autism to hone their strengths, hone their talents. Um, I think what's really frustrating too is, you know, with autism, it's like, you know, clinicians and, you know, social workers and, you know, and I'm not saying that that's that the case for all of them, but I'm saying like, there's some that are like, for the medical model, like, okay, we're going to just diagnose them, give them a diagnosis, we're going to give them treatments and all of that. But the reality is we have to look at, you know, everybody through a biopsychosocial perspective, I like to call it. So it's kind of like you're gaining the bigger picture of you know, who this individual is like, you know, for you, like, you know, I'm not just seeing you as somebody with autism. I'm seeing you as somebody who has, you know, passion for music as somebody who has, you know, experience with other hobbies and interests like poetry and video games. And so, you know, and I'll tell you when I did, when I started public speaking, um, this was right around my junior year of high school. So it was the first time I, did, I was at an elementary school and you know, I did my presentation and, you know, all the students, they didn't ask me questions really about my autism. They were asking me questions like, what's your favorite video game? What do you like to do outside? You know, what's your favorite television show? What's your favorite movie? And it just highlighted that moment because it's like, they're looking at me as a person and not just somebody as a disability. I think, you know, and that's, that's what that shows. Um, so I just yeah, that, that, that's been my goal all my life. Again, almost three years ago, I became, you know, an advocate or activist um, for autism because all my life I wanted to be what I thought I never was when I already was normal. I wanted people to look at me like, like what you said, what's my favorite video game, what's what I do outside, you know, those type of questions. Um, but for me coming up, it wasn't like that. It was, it was you know, constantly being made fun of, constantly being called all word, um, constantly being bullied, you know, constantly being in fights and stuff of that nature, constantly getting picked on. So, I mean, I, I, I wish <laughs> it was like that because, you know, maybe I would have had like a slew of friends, but, you know, instruments became my friends. So I started hearing music, like people hear conversations. So those things became my friends that I could talk to that wouldn't judge me. An instrument wouldn't judge me. It wouldn't tell me I couldn't sit, sit with them on a bus. It wouldn't, you know, stuff of that nature. So I applaud people who don't have to go through, because nobody needs to go through what I went through. And, and autism is not a disability. There's nothing wrong with any individual who has autism. It's just that our voices need to be heard more. Our talents need to be seen more. Our gifts need to be seen more. And, you know, people need to be educated in the proper way. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, just hearing your experiences, I mean, I, I'm inspired by your story as well. I mean, you haven't gone, 
gone through all of these, you know, obstacles along the way and having come this far is, I think is remarkable. Um, and what I can tell you too, I mean, I've, um, <laughs> it's like I've been through autism and then I've also had, you know, I've been through epilepsy too. So I've had two seizures in the past five years and I've also had, I have thyroid disease as well. So um, I actually had to have my thyroid removed, surgically removed. So I'm dealing with all of those challenges now too. So um, it's definitely been a roller coaster for me as well. Um, but, you know, I think even like my parents, you know, they support, you know, the work and, you know, like what I'm trying to do. And um, even, you know, you, my parents, you know, inspired me to, you know, be my best. They've pushed me to be my best. Um, and, you know, I think another thing that's interesting is um, I think sometimes there's some parents that, you know, have concerns and worries that they're, you know, um, adult son or daughter might, you know, fail at something. And I think what has to be acknowledged is that, you know, it's okay to fail, you know, yes. it's like, I think failure, you know, you learn so much, you know, from that experience. And it's like, you know, people with autism, you know, have, I, 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 you know, in my opinion, I think, you know, they're, I think pretty much every single individual with autism has encountered some sort of failure at some point in their lives, whether if it's an academic failure or a social failure or an emotional failure, but it's not a, ref a reflection, you know, necessarily on them. It's, it's not on them. It's, you know, I, I, I think it goes back to what we were saying. I think sometimes people just don't acknowledge our differences, you know, and it's sometimes it's like, you know, what we think might be, you know, considered, you know, the social norm might not be for somebody else who doesn't even have autism. But it's the problem is, is it's kind of like with perspective taking, like, okay, you know, I'm somebody with autism, and then this is a person without autism. Yeah, this person without autism might be learning about autism, but they don't have the lived experience like we do. Right, right. I mean, I, I, again, this, this is what I'm saying. Our community is so remarkable. There's people that there's lawyers and doctors and winning America's next top got talent. And there, there's people doing basketball players, NASCAR drive. There's people doing amazing stuff with autism. Those and and people's stories need to be celebrated. People's stories need to be heard. Their trials, their tribulations, their joy, their pain, their their sadness of dealing with autism. They have a lot of these groups out here. They got groups, you know, high functioning, whatever the name of the group is. And they seem to be showing support and rattling around other people who have autism or their children or whatever. That's what we need more of. We just, we all are one big family and we all just need to come together, period, more and let these people know who don't know more about our family. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think the other thing too is, and I say this to people all the time, but um, you know, we, you know, people really shouldn't take things for granted. Like, you know, I'm very thankful, you know, and I'm sure you're really thankful to be, you know, where you're at today, you know, in, in terms of, you know, our own lives and stuff. And because there's people that are dealing with, might be dealing with similar challenges, other, you know, individuals with autism who are dealing with a lot of challenges and, you know, they're struggling to find those successes. And there's even individuals with autism who aren't, still are not talking and they're not verbalizing and right. gesturing. And, you know, doctors and, you know, <laughs> they didn't think I was ever going to talk or function or, you know, I was not talking or <laughs> verbalizing when I was right. And I was diagnosed at around two. So um, it was pretty, um, like it was really clear to my family and friends that something was wrong when I was very, very young. Um, and there, there've been people that have told me like, you know, you should be in, you know, they, I shouldn't say to me specifically, but maybe to like my parents and stuff like, Oh, I should be institutionalized. Oh, you know, like he has weird thoughts and, you know, feelings and whatever, or, you know, you should smack your son for his bad behavior or, you know, whatever the case may be. There's all these different like stigmas, stereotypes, et cetera. And um, you know what? 
a lot of times those statements are like false. And oftentimes it's like, I feel like people don't have a clue what the way that, you know, don't have a clue what they're saying. It's kind of like sometimes they just don't have a filter. <laughs> so. well, I want to applaud your parents. I want to applaud them. And I want to definitely say thank you for believing in your son. Um, as a father myself to a four-year-old boy, I understand wholeheartedly. I mean, you know, you're talking to somebody that's been in 16, 17 different mental institutions and, and the, the situations that happen in those situations. Um, when I was unver when I was non-verbalizing until 13, 13 and a half at a two-year-old's level. And, you know, I get it, but look where you are now. If they would have put you in those mental institutions, if they would have medicated you, if they would have zombified your personality and break down your character from a mental institution, right. where would you be? See, yeah. we, we, we have to understand that a diagnosis is what it is. It's a diagnosis. It's no different from somebody saying, hey, you have a blood clot in your leg. That don't mean <laughs> that just because you got a blood clot in your leg that you can't walk or you can't run or you can't move your leg. They just letting you know okay, you might want to get some research or something because you do have blood clot in your leg, but that don't mean that you out the game. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that when we talk about autism, we have to understand when, you, when your child or your adult or whoever get diagnosed, it's just what it is. It's not the end of the game. It's just the beginning of it, actually. Because these people can will grow up to be incredible, intelligent, smart, amazing people but you have to look past the diagnosis and see them as the person that they are and the gift that they have absolutely i mean you know and it's i mean you know you know following up on that um especially with autism and again you know at when i spoke with um another individual uh, just recently about this but you know the analogy this is in the analogy that i'm going to use so Autism, you know, it's kind of like you have an iPhone and an Android, okay? So the iPhone and the Android, they're both a phone. They're both like a cell phone. Do they have different features? Yes. And I think what's important to understand is, you know, we all, okay, yeah, we, we do have differences. So yeah, we might have, you know, different, you know, strengths, different talents, different abilities. Um, but we're still people at the end of the day, you know, yes. we're still, I mean, yeah, we might have autism. We might have some challenges. We might have things that are a little bit difficult, more difficult for us than for the average person, but we're still people. We're still, you know, we're still capable of doing a lot of things. And I think that's what people need to acknowledge, you know, and I think, especially for those that think, Oh, people with autism can't really do much. It's like, um, I don't know where they get that from. I don't know who exactly. told whoever, who said that, what rumor was spread. I don't know, but that's far from the case. Yeah. And it's, and, you know, I'm not no medical doctor. I can't prescribe or give out medical advice or anything. What worked for me was Jesus. What worked for me was God. Mm -hmm. So I, that's the only advice I can give to a parent or anything. I'm, you know, I spread my testimony and I help spread awareness and we go to travel to schools and festivals and different things of that nature to bring more awareness to autism as a whole and as a community. Um, but it's strictly to get people to really understand one thing. It's not a disability. It's not the end of the world. There's nothing wrong with all autistic people. And we need um, we have a lot to give to this world. And you're right. We are just individuals. There's nothing wrong with us. So at the end of the day, hey, hey, like us or love us. That's what you can do. Like us and love us, period. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think, you know, I you tell people, you know, like the the world needs all different kinds of minds, you know, like people with autism have different minds, different ways of, 
you know, approaching different problems and salute, you know, and they have different solutions and, you know, they have a lot to offer. And I think we have to start putting more, like people have to start putting more of a positive light, you know, for these individuals, not just like, okay, this is autism. These are the symptoms and the, you know, oh, no, they might not be able to talk or they may not be able to do this. Because at the end of the day, um, kind of like I was saying earlier, I'm not really thinking about, you know, IQ. I'm not going to think about, you know, whether they have a higher salary position or a lower salary position or, you know, whatever the case may be, whatever the, the situation is, I think, you know, everybody has their own means of how they want to live life, you know. Some people want to live a simple life and some people want to live the deluxe life. Um, so I think, you know, no matter where somebody with autism is, you know, as long as they're happy with themselves, I think that's what matters the most. You know, you just don't, you know, I don't even think about what other people say or, you know, like, because it's, no, like, no, the end of the day, it's no. like, it's all about what makes you happy. You know, what makes us happy? you know, what fulfills our lives. And kind of like what you're saying, you know, in terms of your faith, I think, you know, part of my experiences was, you know, my, you know, my faith as well, you know, my parents were praying for me every single night, you know, my mom was praying for me, like to get better and stuff. And voila, there I am today. So, you know, you're a walking miracle. I'm a walking miracle. There's millions of people who share our same story, who share our same um, miracleness. But, you know, again, I truly applaud your parents because it takes a whole village and it takes an extra village. It takes a village when you're dealing with somebody who may not have or may not deal with what we deal with. But to, to have somebody deal with what we deal with, it may take an extra village. You understand what I'm saying? Because my son is four and he's a grown man by himself. You understand what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so, so, you know, to see you, this is, has to be one of the most phenomenal, impactful interviews I have ever done. Oh. Because, number, cause, cause it's two autistic individuals breaking bread of, and, and, and retaining knowledge from each other. And, and that's, what the bigger picture needs to be. Look what we can become if we come together. Look what we can become if we stop labeling and stop titling and just start loving and accepting. Absolutely. Absolutely. So unfortunately we are out of time. Um, oh, that's fine. That's I wanted, fine. <laughs> I wanted to say um, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, do you oh, yeah. have any final um, comments, any final thoughts that you would like to share with us before we start? I want to thank you, Ryan, for letting me be on your show. Look out for my documentary that's coming out. It's called My First Words with Music. Um, that's coming out November 11th. Shout out to my team, you know, Rafia, Vanessa Bob, Jackie Pilgrimage, uh, Audrea Rowe. Shoot. Uh, Mary Mitchell. Kathy Teller, I mean, just a whole bunch of people, Anthony Johnson, that just helps me, you know, with my walk, with my brand and stuff of that nature. And listen, we really got to break bread. I don't know where you at, but I don't mind getting on the plane. Once we get this virus down a little bit, you know, we really got to break bread. I really will come where you at. We really got to do some lunch. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Like maybe even do like a, like a public speaking engagement, you know. With oh, people. listen, I'm, I'm de where, where are you? I'm from Massachusetts, um, so okay, okay. I'm along the East Coast too. Or, um, I did you? I don't. You from? Well, I'm, I'm in Martins. Yeah, I'm in Martinsburg, West Virginia. So oh, West, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know. I'm familiar with Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So because I was again, I was looking at your um, bio earlier, and I, I it said Georgia. So I don't know if that's where you were living. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. I was living in Georgia for a long time, so okay. I just recently came up here. So. Okay. Well, again, uh, Marcus, it was, it was a pleasure to have you here on the show and I know that Likewise. we'll continue to be in touch and yes, sir. Um, thank you for, you know, sharing your experiences. Um, and I look forward to, um, like, as I said, keeping in touch with you. Yes, sir. All yes, right. Sir. Take care.